Hey, Fergus, thank you very much. And you did uh, pick a good uh, topic because it's true that over the years I have uh, studied uh, China in detail. So I hope I can uh, I can tell you some interesting things. There's, there's so much to talk about here. I mean, it's just such a big topic and important and an important one. Before we actually get into the meat of the issue, though, why don't you just explain your relationship with Epoch Times and how that publication came into into existence? Yeah, that's another that's another interesting story. So obviously, uh, we have everybody here knows your uh, penchant for freedom and independence and intellectual honesty, and that's why we are a good fit because Epoch Times is actually I always like to say a Chinese anti-propaganda which was founded by uh, expat Chinese and in some cases refugees because they had to leave China after the communist regime started to persecute the Falun Gong uh, spiritual practice. Wh and when they, did that begin? That was in 1999, yeah, it's already uh, almost uh, 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, crazy. And it keeps going on with uh, the most horrible atrocity uh, being the organ harvesting where they kill off practitioners of conscience, not just Falun Gong practitioners, but prisoners of conscience, but mostly mostly those, they have them on file and then they, uh, if somebody needs a heart or a liver or whatever, they just kill them off on demand. And there's some shocking, shocking documentaries uh, about that, including investigative reportings where they call the hospitals, the military hospitals in, in many cases, and they're like, yeah, I need an organ, uh, I need a heart, do you have one? Next week, they're like, yeah, yeah, sure, we have it. Uh, it's like, yeah, is it from Falun Gong practitioners? Yeah, we have those. Uh, it's crazy. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's absolutely it's, insane. It's yeah. hard to believe. And so there's, there's a very sinister or dark underbelly to China. And I don't even know if it's an underbelly. Maybe it's just right out in front of everyone's eyes if you want to look. But so the, the challenge I have in understanding the role of China is that on the one hand, I see this nation expanding its influence around the world and engaging in espionage. We can dis discuss how they do that. And But at the same time, I hear very pessimistic reviews of the economy. Uh, one man who's become famous for predicting the collapse of China is Gordon Chang. I assume you're familiar with this guy. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, so he's written The Coming Collapse of China. He wrote it back in 2001. It's a bit early, but... Yeah, yeah. So he's, he, he's predicted it multiple times for not to quite come to be. So what is going on? On the one hand, like you said, we see this expanding power, but on the other hand, maybe a paper tiger in terms of its actual economic clout. So you're asking me about uh, the economy and this uh, dichotomy. And yeah, the, 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 definitely... the expanding political power, not, but at the same time, str the problems with the economy. These seem to go work against each other. So I will definitely answer that. To round it off, you asked me. Uh, I forgot about that. Uh, I got too lost in, in, in the details. <laughs> but you, you asked me. Uh, you asked me about Epoch Times, and I, I told you about the organ harvesting. So just very quickly to round that off. Oh yeah, sure, uh, sure. We have been reporting on that topic for a long time because the founders were uh, Falun Gong practitioners. And that's why we have this independent, I wouldn't say unbiased view, uh, that would be uh, too much. That's why I say it's anti-propaganda and we are independent and we have a lot of inside sources uh, in China who uh, give us information. And by now, the Chinese edition is the largest independent Chinese media, independent Chinese media right. in the world. So, so yeah, so Chinese anti-propaganda reporting on the human rights abuses, but also we do have a big cloud because... We still get a lot of inside information and we have branched off into English, um, you know, French, German, you name it, uh, different editions. So, so much for, for Epoch. Now to your question about the economy and uh, I would agree with you and, and the politics, I would agree with you. Uh, that's what the, the uh, people have an issue with. I mean, people tend to have an issue with that in general. They, can't, they cannot look at things in a nuanced uh, perspective. So you have people like... Gordon Chang, who says China's going to collapse, China's going to collapse. And they may, you know, who knows. And then you have people like Stephen Roach and the McKinsey people who are like the cool aiders. They're like, oh, China's going to overtake the U.S., China's going to overtake the U.S. And then you look at those, both of those positions, and then if you really look at it honestly, you they are lacking the nuance. Where on the one hand, it is true 
that the Chinese uh, have found a way to utilize the vast resources of formerly cheap labor by getting in and stealing uh, a lot of uh, Western capital and, and technology. And so they've grown a lot and they are now, you know, any, whether I don't like purchasing power parity, but even if you use the exchange rates, uh, the official ones, they are the second largest economy in the world. It's not very difficult if you have 1.3 billion people. But uh, having said that, it's also you can't deny that many, most, many regions in China, not all of them, mostly the coast, they uh, have um, achieved a relatively high standard of development. So uh, even though it was still mostly state directed, they gave some freedom to the people and the people used it for production. And so it's not a miracle. It's just it's just normal. And if you have 1.3 billion people, then that's what uh, happens. And with this, of course, uh, they are the biggest, one of the biggest, uh, maybe it's the European Union trading nation in the world. So obviously, uh, also their uh, political influence and clout has increased, especially with uh, smaller countries who are sort of still buying into this, oh, if we deal with China, we are going to get rich philosophy and mentality. But as we all know, how does this work between a corrupt third world country in Africa and a statist communist country in China. It's basically the officials make deals uh, that benefit mostly the officials, uh, especially in the local, uh, in the in the African country. And, the, you know, then the Chinese workers come in and they build whatever they want to build. And the country is settled with debts and the people have to pay it off. So this is also, you know, I mean, it's not that Western nations didn't do similar things. It's just China does it in a more crude way. But because they provide some sort of competition to the West, they're having, I would say, limited success with it because, and this is where we transition into the economic problem, domestic economic problem. It's, most of these investments are not very productive. Like if you talk about, then some research about the one belt, one road, where everybody's throwing around these trillion dollar figures. And then you see the investments that they actually have made that are operational, which are in the tens of billions at most, are not very productive. They're either not running at all or they're running way below capacity. Uh, so it's a waste of money. Do you want to, actually, do you want to clarify this Belt and Road Initiative? Because for many people, they won't have heard of that term. And what exactly is the objective here? So maybe, I mean, my sense is that maybe the goal is not economic productivity. It's, it, there are other goals. So perhaps even if, even if these investments aren't really showing economic fruits, Maybe they're achieving other motives. Yeah, sure. So the One Bad One Road is this huge, you know, sort of uh, some people dub it the Chinese Marshall Plan, but not for Europe. It's for Central Asia mostly and uh, Southeast Asia where China is just investing. And this is also not true. It's not them who are like, you know, buying stuff or giving away. It's many loans, many things that the countries themselves are doing and are hiring Chinese companies with huge infrastructure investments in military, electricity, uh, railways, roads. And this is supposed to bring a revival to the old Silk Road that we had back in the days. And yeah, of course, they're uh, trying to pursue other objectives and trying to make those countries like Pakistan subservient to them and luring them away from the West. But as the West has learned during the last couple of decades, those countries just aren't reliable partners. And China is not going to be able to change that. And they're not going to be able to change the corruption and the lack of business mentality that those company, that those countries have. It's uh, almost impossible. I mean, people have been trying that for decades. And in, in rare cases in Bangladesh, maybe it may have worked a little bit, but in other cases, or India, but in a, and even there, you know, India is a mess in many ways, and it doesn't want to work with China on that. So, and that's the way the Chinese also do business domestically. It's um, so they have an ulterior motive for almost everything. It's not production uh, or efficiency. It's uh, you know how can the official make the most money, um, which is why the state-run industries uh, companies are running at a basically at a loss. Uh, but the cronies who run them, they are they're having a good time. They're making a lot of money, and this is why the Chinese economic miracle, which wasn't a miracle but really just a logical uh, if, uh, consequence of utilizing cheap labor and, and land and stealing 
foreign technology and 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 acquiring foreign capital uh, has run its course because right now it's basically a credit it's basically a credit bubble, a huge credit bubble, where the low hanging fruit of building infrastructure and houses and railways and stuff like that has been exhausted, and now you actually have to go into become a market economy where the capital is allocated. Uh, according to market-based needs and not according to official cronies. I mean, obviously, I would argue that a market development would have yielded much higher growth rates and much more results anyway. But now even the the growth rates they could achieve before by centrally directing capital, uh, they won't be able to achieve anymore. Why? Because they wasted so much capital. I mean, what generates growth is capital accumulation and innovation, but they wasted so much capital for useless projects that were uh, centrally planned and allocated with ulterior motives in mind. So there's not much growth to be had for that. And any marginal additional project that is allocated according to the same basis will yield even less growth. And that's where, frankly, the economic problems are coming in, where China has hit the middle income trap. The official At official exchange rates, the average income per capita is less than $7,000. That's less than what the Japanese, much less than what the Japanese have at around 50,000 50, in the 90s when they hit their credit uh, bubble trap. So, yeah, the Chinese, uh, they have a lot of issues. And then uh, here come the next people, the Gordon Changs. They're like, it has to collapse. It has to collapse. And that's why I'm also saying, like, not really, because Japan also didn't collapse. And there are so many ways when you control the credit allocation mechanism and you control the banks and you control the bookkeeping. I mean, we saw it in the West in 2008 when all of a sudden so many bookkeeping standards were suspended and banks just weren't allowed to go bankrupt. And the Chinese have been doing that with the local governments already, which uh, technically are bankrupt and defaulted, but because of several bookkeeping gimmicks, they're still out there. So, and until you basically you're ready and willing to really make a clean sweep and clean up all the bad debts, you can have the zombie economy like Japan for a long time, except for because China had uh, everything basically state directed and allocated. It's uh, the the spoils of this credit growth are much more uneven and 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 the average income is is lower for more than 40 years top financial experts and private investors from all over the world have gathered for the new orleans investment conference to discover new opportunities and strategies exchange ideas and plan for the coming year to learn more about today's investing environment and updates, join Mark Skousen, Peter Schiff, Brian London, Robert Kiyosaki, Doug Casey, and dozens of other experts at this year's event from the 1st to the 4th of November. Go to NewOrleansConference.com to register today. What I'm reading from your hearing is that, yes, the Chinese economy under the central planning approach has plateaued. But and also its foreign games or inter, its foreign strategies don't aren't necessarily paying dividends economically. But does that mean that the expansionary ambitions of the Chinese Communist Party or those who rule China or the People's Republic of China are those going to be are they are they going to come undone by their own f failings? Well, eventually they have to. I mean, it's the same as uh, as the Japanese who were buying up all sorts of, uh, you know, the people thought in the 90s that the Japanese are going to take over America because they were <laughs> buying so much property and so many companies and the Chinese sort of tried to do the same. But yeah, of course, I mean, uh, eventually, if you can't back up your uh, your money with production, then uh, you're going to have an issue and the yuan is probably going to devalue and that means they can buy fewer uh, foreign things and they can uh, make fewer resources available to bribe African officials. I mean, again, you know, it's a huge country, it's a huge economy. Uh, does that mean they won't have anything left? No, of course not. I mean, they're bigger than Japan, Japan right now. But will they have enough left uh, or can they make enough, allocate enough of the resources to bribe foreign people and invest in ineffective uh, projects abroad. And then another thing is, yeah, what's the use? You know, again, even if you make Pakistan subservient 
to your own goals and needs. I mean, what's the benefit if you cannot solve the situation at home? If you have a huge credit collapse, you can't produce it, you know, you can't use your capacity. I mean, Pakistan is not going to make up for the import demand of the United States or even uh, domestic industry once once that unwinds. So if you're asking me, is it going to go on and become much bigger and more successful? And is China going to take over the world? I would say definitely not. Uh, but if you ask me, will it stop completely um, and they're going to withdraw and just sort out their own issues? That's also definitely not. So probably the situation that we have right now, if they can manage and not go bust and sort of postpone and uh, extend and pretend, then we're just going to have what we have right now uh, for the foreseeable future. The only thing that I do think is possible because of of the domestic stress and also because of the uh, pressure through the trade uh, that President Trump is putting on them, that the yuan might devalue significantly in the in the not so very distant future. What do the economic challenges? What impact do they have on, let's say, the civil, civil, the glaring civil liberties problems domestically? So, I'm not an expert on this. This is why I've got you on. Of course, the I don't understand exactly what is going on. For example, with the ethnic cleansing in China, and apparently there's some kind of citizenship score people people have now. I mean, obviously, free speech that's out the door. And I've even read that there are, there's basically eugenics research going on in China. So there's a heck of a lot going on there that is unsavory, to say the least. Is this changing anytime soon or just getting worse? Ooh, that's, a, that's, another, that's another tricky one because, because so first of all, your principal assessment is correct. China is uh, uh, one of the worst countries for basic freedom, and which we all know is based on property rights and even though they have allowed some property rights, but that's, you know, sanctioned by the state. It's not an absolute. And uh, freedom to your body, which for many people who don't agree with the Communist Party or who are of a different ethnicity, like the Uyghurs, or you happen to practice a spiritual practice like Falun Gong, then, you know, then those freedoms don't exist at all and you may get killed and tortured. So... And it is true that the control is getting worse in some ways with the surveillance and the score, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's definitely not good. But what we see uh, from our vantage point, and we've gotten some intel on that, is that President Xi Jinping is actually, he is in favor at least of easing up on the persecution of the Falun Gong practitioners, which he, we think, believes is, is a giant waste, uh, even from the communist perspective. And but, but what does he need to achieve in order to do that? And this is where it becomes interesting, because you have to see that Jiang Zemin, the former uh, president, he started the persecution against the Falun Gong, and he put in all his cronies to, to important posts like the security minister, Zhu Yongkang. He was important. He was also the head of the petroleum faction. And, and now what do you do if you say your long-term game plan is at least to one group? And this is really a big deal in China. It's like there were 100 million people doing Falun Gong in the 90s. You want to give freedom to them, but you've got all those people invested in the persecution of that us who is still in power. So if really your long-term game plan is to give freedom to those and maybe freedom to others, more freedom to others, then at first you have to get rid of the crooks. And obviously, how do you, in a communist society, how do you get rid of the crooks? You cement your own power and you abuse any kind of state power that you have at your disposal, like the anti-corruption laws, and use those to get rid of those people. And we can definitely track very clearly that he has gotten disproportionately, he's gotten rid of Jiang Zemin cronies like Zhu Yongkang and Bo Zhilai. They were the biggest figures, but many others in the anti-corruption campaign, they were old Jiang Zemin cronies, and she just basically got rid of them. Now, this is our understanding of how things go, but obviously we don't have a guarantee for that. So it looks like one communist faction is purging another communist faction. It's not like we haven't seen this before in history. And then what? Yeah, what's the outcome kind of going to be? Is it Soviet Union type of scenario where you have uh, Gorbachev cementing his power and then basically 
providing more freedom, relatively speaking. I mean, it's not like Russia is a fantastic place, but, you know, compared to old Soviet times, probably better than then. Or is it going to be a Stalin case where, you know, he grabs the power and gets rid of everybody and then it's going to be it's going to be Xi Jinping time for the next 50 years. I would personally believe the indications that we have, it's, it's going to be more of the Gorbachev uh, scenario, even without the, the solution of the Communist Party. Uh, who knows when or that is going to happen, but that's definitely a possibility. But the other case is not off the table, judging by the actions of what the Chinese uh, regime leader is doing at this moment. One of the reasons why I see the China issue as so important is that obviously we, we have the United States as the dominant world power. And we can all criticize the United States for intervention around the world, many of it uh, being um, counterproductive. However... At least when the United States engages abroad, there's some sort of democratic accountability. And my fear is that if the Chinese were to gain more influence around the world, they would basically be exporting their suppressive ways. Are there examples of this where the Chinese are exporting basically their communist or top-down, I'm not sure, Marxist-Leninist approaches? Well, yeah, I think uh, you probably know best that uh, Venezuela is a good example where at least, you know, it's not like those crooks needed to learn from the Chinese, but the Chinese did prop them <laughs> is, is, did prop them up for a long uh, time because without all the loans that are now in default from China, that regime might have collapsed a long time ago. The same is true with with uh, Cuba and I don't know who else that, that but yeah pretty much any any criminal or government or even private organization I think that the Chinese they also sub support the Mexican drug cartels they get propped up at least by the Chinese I, I don't think the crooks of this world uh, need to learn uh, from the Chinese or nor do they want to obviously the North Koreans are propped up by them but they're definitely the Chinese are helping them for sure. And with more, the more resources they, they have, the more they can help out those uh, corrupt and uh, criminal regimes and crooks around the world. I hear you. Yeah, I mean, Venezuela is a most blatant case where the regime there, of course, has relied on Chinese debt and other support. And that has just allowed a brutal dictatorship to remain in power. So, so it wasn't necessarily like the Chinese were exporting it, but they were maintaining it. Now, maybe you want to comment, this is perhaps more sensitive, about how the United States should or could address the problem of China in a way that leads to a more, not, maybe more benevolent or more liberalized country in the next decades, in the coming decades? Okay, so yeah, that's a good uh, question. So so how do we know? Uh, I actually attended a pretty interesting speech. Uh, it was it was interesting, but I forgot the guy's name, but he talked about how the other statist countries of Asia transformed. And Taiwan is an interesting example because Taiwan was a right-wing dictatorship. Yeah, mm. uh, and they kind of did a similar thing. They just, you know, let the economy loose, but then they 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 kept the power, the political power, and uh, and they just then realized that they, they eventually they weren't going to keep they wouldn't keep power anymore, so they just uh, mm. let it transition to a to to a dem democracy. Very good example, but you need that type of enlightened leader like a Gorbachev uh, to be able to do that. We don't know whether Xi Jinping is that. Uh, and I'm going to come back to the United States after I sort of uh, evaluate the scenarios. Now, Korea, South Korea, interestingly enough, they were also under sort of sort of dictatorship where there was one guy, I forgot the name, who, you know, just he didn't want to let go of power and he got killed by the, their own intelligence agency. And then it became more democratic. So we get a couple of uh, different scenarios, but one scenario is just so. So we have a couple of top-down scenarios uh, where where the, the the cronies themselves could say we're gonna just uh, allow more freedom in general, or we could have some uh, parts, you know, a faction of the cronies say, okay, now it's enough, and we're gonna stage a sort of coup. Or it could come from the people, and uh, how how does any? I mean, I think India's uh, India's ex 
uh, even though it's a mess now, I think the example how they gained independence from the British is is great because it was by non-violent, uh, passive uh, resistance, just withdrawing their support uh, for the cronies. And the more Chinese people get that, then the sooner we can see a transition to a democracy or something even better. I mean, both of us, you know, believe that people, uh, they don't necessarily need, need a government. And who knows, maybe it's the Chinese who are going to pioneer that. That would be awesome. So uh, how can the United States bring that about? It's, uh, I think there's two ways. So one way is the one which President Trump is going, and it's basically not cooperating with the cronies, which is what the Chinese people should do. Don't cooperate with the cronies. And who are the cronies? It's the people in charge of all the companies who have most of the exports, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Most of them. There's also private people who don't have anything to do with it. But most of it is still run by the Communist Party Click and their cronies. So don't cooperate mm-hmm. with them. How do you not cooperate with them? It's by, you know, I read this article about this crazy shipping uh, treaty that they had. The Chinese can ship stuff for less than a dollar on the USPS, whereas Americans cannot and that's why the Chinese can sell counterfeit goods coming from China cheaper uh, than the original products made in the United States. So don't co- don't do that. Don't cooperate with them on that level. Uh, don't give them the preferable treatment that they have on the WTO. Uh, raise the tariff to the same level at the very least. So uh, all of this stuff, you know, uh, don't let them buy your stuff here in the United States so they can gut the companies and export their technology. Uh, so this is, these are all ways that a, a government, which is managing trade and international relations, can basically not cooperate with that regime. And that will cause problems sooner or later. Like, you know, uh, what's, that, what's the guy's name? Uh, Yuri Bezmanov, the, the KGB defector. Uh, yes. Yeah, he was like, why do you keep sending uh, corn and, and food to the Soviet regime? Yeah, it's nice of you that you don't want the people there to starve. But at the end of the day, you're still propping up the regime. And uh, now with China, the, the issue is the same on trade. Now, having said that, by now, the, the global production chains are so uh, intertwined. And in a way, in a way, you really do need China to churn out products at a certain scale and at a certain price and with a certain quality. So don't kid yourself that this non-cooperation won't come at a price. There will be a price to pay. But all things considered, the price uh, that the cronies are going to be paying is higher than the U.S. consumers are going to be paying. Second solution, which obviously nobody's thinking about, but I did write an article on that, is stop worrying so much about what's going on internationally and focus more on what's going on nationally. And President Trump and the Republicans are already going in that direction. Obviously not far enough, because my preposition is if you scrap all taxes, and I'm serious, like all tax, like, you know, uh, we had back before the Federal Reserve, and most regulations, I would like to say all regulations, but let's say most regulations, then this country would be so competitive and so prosperous that the state control, even if it's 1.3 billion, state control Chinese, they could not afford to buy one of uh, your better companies. And they could not compete with your prices, even though the wages are going to be 100 times higher. Obviously, that would take time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but that would be another way to go. And then the Chinese can just do whatever they want to do, because the United States will be even more prosperous and competitive and happy and easier to defend than under the current status quo.